Hey everyone, welcome to the Darshan Talks podcast. I'm your host, Darshan Kulkarni. It's my mission to help you trust the products you depend on. As you know, I'm an attorney, I'm a pharmacist, and I advise companies with FDA regulated products. So if you think about drugs, wonder about devices, or obsess over pharmacy, this is the podcast, this is the live stream for you. Um, I do have to specify I'm an attorney, but I'm not your attorney. I'm a lawyer, uh, I'm, a, I'm a pharmacist, but I'm not your pharmacist. So this is not legal advice. This is not clinical advice. And our guest today is also a pharmacist and he's not giving you uh, clinical advice either. Uh, we do these live streams because they're a lot of fun. I personally find myself learning something new every single time. And our guest today has been on several times before. And every time he teaches me something new, but it's always nice to know that someone's listening. So if you like what you hear, please like, leave a comment or subscribe. Um, if you wanna ask our guest questions, please, please, please ask them uh, in the comments section. We are looking for them and we do try to respond to them. Um, if you actually like the video itself, uh, please share the video. Um, if you wanna find me and you wanna reach out to me, just uh, reach out to me on Twitter uh, at Darshan Talks or just go to our website at darshantalks.com. Mm -hmm. Today's live stream is going to be about pharmacy. We're going to talk a little bit about the news from the USP and from the FDA and how all this ties into client management, ties into um, reactive versus proactive planning and, and how it all comes together. Our guest for today is, is a little bit of an expert, isn't he? He is the vice president of compounding compliance with Gates Healthcare Associates, and he's a subject matter expert in compounding and therapeutics. Our guest for today is Ken Spidell, Dr. Ken Spidell. And, uh, and again, thank you for coming on, Ken. How are you? Very good. How are you? I, I have been well. I have been busy. It's It's been a few uh, months of sure craziness mixed with complete and total slowdown. Uh, how about you? You know, it's a great way to describe it. <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> I, I'd say sometimes unorganized chaos, and then there's chaos, yeah. and then there's the, the, there's there's somewhat of a, 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 a quiet wave, and we need that quiet <laughs> wave every once in a while. But yeah, so, certainly, you know, a lot of my my, my practice is, it, you know, it's certainly virtual as well, and more yep. and more virtual. But I, I on site is where it is, and where I where I want it to be, and I think where it's most effective because when you're assessing organizations and clients and trying to be, as you said, more proactive and not reactive, until you physically see it, you can't see a whole lot through these phones. You know, and somebody say, take the phone. Well, we don't want to take the phones in the clean room and all that kind of stuff. So, yeah, yeah, yeah. so that's that, that's the hard part, trying to do that and trying to make it meaningful to, to clients and, and all that. So, well, I, I'm glad you're busy. I'm glad things are, are, are moving forward. You're an amazing guy and, and your Thank diversity you. of opinion and your diversity of, of skills. And I, I've always kind of said that a little bit about myself as well, my clinical background and also the regulatory side of background and kind of a broader scope. And I think that's very important. Maybe, maybe that's why you and I get along so well, because we can have this kind of broad, broad discussion. So uh, as, as you as you have said, you're not everybody's uh, attorney in, in the, here, but I would love to be everybody's uh, a consultant uh, officially. So uh, I'd, I'd love you guys to uh, to connect connect in and uh, work with uh, my, my organization, Gates Healthcare Associates. So if they thank you and, and, and give them uh, give them a hit and uh, they'll, get, they'll get a hold of you and and, uh, and or, or text me or, or send excuse me, send me an email. So however, would love to be your subject matter expert and help you kind of through all of this turbulence <clears throat> that's going on and again, Let's try to be more premeditated and not reactive. So, so that's concept. that's really the question, though, right, Ken? I mean, we're talking about being premeditated. So h here's my question: we're, uh, we we can start off by the news from USP. Could, could you tell us a little bit about what happened? What did the, what did USP kind of come out with? What is USP for those people who are going? Wait, what are you talking about now? Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, very good point. Good start. Uh, United States Pharmacopeia is a standard uh, setting uh, organization, essentially. It's nonprofit, but they, they, they obviously need to make money on their standards and whatever. And it's been from the American College of Surgeons years ago, you know, defining monographs and formulations and things. And then it gets into this is kind of the standard 
for, for pharmacy practice? Well, manufacturers use it and they use various chapters of USP and USP says this is the standard for this, this and this. And well, within the sector of compounding pharmacy, whether it's, whether it's what we call 503A, which is traditional compounding, where there's a prescriber, a pharmacy, pharmacist and, and a patient in this, I'll call the iron triangle, that's 503A and that's traditional compounding. And that's very, very important that you are compliant with those regulations. And so there's regulations in USP uh, specifically, it's called 795, that's a chapter, and that's the non-sterile uh, 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 standards of practice. And then there's 797, which is the aseptic or sterile uh, uh, practices, as well as the USP 800 should be implemented soon. So back to square, the USP had, had made proposals in 2019. And they said, okay, here we're gonna propose these, these, these modifications of our standards. And, it, but unfortunately, well, fortunately it was kicked back and it said, hey, you know, there's some issues that, that the stakeholders have with some of those things. And it predominantly, it was it centered around beyond the use dates. So those that don't know, that's essentially the compounding way of saying it's an expiry date, but it's entirely different than what you would say a commercial product's expiry date. So you say, well, this is, you don't use it beyond this, this date. Well, folks felt that, in, and I agree, folks felt that it should be um, more extended so it can actually meet the needs of the public. So the, the underserved and the served, you know, can have the proper uh, beyond the use dates, and, but without affecting the quality of the preparation. And we don't call them pro products. We use products in compounding. We call them preparations. So we want to make sure that we have enough time and the client has enough time to get it as well as utilize it safely so it's not going to degrade and have issues. So that was kicked back and then COVID hits and everything was slowed down and on and on. So just last month, the end of last month, so the end of August, they came out with their revisions. <clears throat> and uh, the predominantly, the, the, there's a lot of individual components, and I've, I've, done, I've done my review and assessment and, and uh, sent that out to my clients, but, and, and this is a proposal, so they're waiting for stakeholder uh, comments, so please go on, you see Darshan has the USP. Please go on and make your stakeholder comments and find that, say, hey, I don't like this or well, I'd like this or whatever, let them know. So make sure that you are a stakeholder in this and it's gonna affect you, because it will. So there's a lot of different things in here. Specifically, what's changed is more so on a new category called category three. So they proposed in 2019 category one and category two and those predominantly are the differences in terms of the environment the environment it's done in, whether whether it's a, an ante room a total clean room facility or there is what we call a segregated area and so the category one is segregated area category two is a clean room facility well category three has extended buds but it's actually closer in my opinion it's closer to what i would say is 503b which is more CGMP, more on the manufacturing side. It's not, it's clearly not there, but it's getting more because there's more requirements uh, in regards to, to the aseptic monitoring, the facility monitoring, the environmental controls, uh, how you use sporocytals and when you use sporocytals, how often, how often you test your viables um, versus the other categories. So it's much more personnel. Uh, training and validation of, of the personnel is, 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 is stepped up a bit. Batch, batch size has been reduced uh, <clears throat> and the stability indicating assays are allowed to be used. Those essentially are assessment to see if this chemical that's in a solution or whatever it's in a suspension is going to be stable. And that's stable through forced degradation, that's stable through container closures, it's stable. And, and it's a pretty expensive process to get stability indicating assays. But when those that do, and when you do, then the USP says, okay, if those standards are compliant with our standards, I believe it's 1225 chapter, and it says if that's done accordingly compliant with our chapter, and then sterility is done, testing is done, and or you do terminal sterilization, in other words, use an autoclave or dry heat oven, or whatever. They say we're gonna we're gonna allow you to have an extended beyond the use date. And so that's helpful, but it's gonna have some expense. So it's a so, big, big change. 
you're, you're right. It's a huge change. It is in many ways in the interest of patients, but do you think it raises unique issues of safety or do you think that the proposed uh, the proposal addresses the potential safety issues that get raised? There you go. Well, as you, as you well know, I mean, even in manufacturing, even in traditional manufacturing, things happen. And it's it, it, you you can't you can't eliminate everything, and you you can only back to being more proactive versus reactive, and <clears throat> process validation, 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 validation. It, you you can validate till you 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 just live and breathe validation, but the problem is you know there's there's a there's a business model you have to meet to say can this this meet this business model, so. Uh, I, of course, there's a risk. Of course, there's a risk to anything. Of course, there's a risk when uh, you're in a hospital and somebody is using a traditional pharmaceutical and taking that, reconstituting that and transferring and putting it into a bag. Is that the bag have the right pH? Are you going to have a problem with a degradation? Did you look at dext- D5W versus normal saline and look at the pH of that? And did the pH necessarily affect that chemical? Because one is more acidic than the other. And you've got it, you can, and that's traditional. And so you're just following a traditional approach. So there's a lot of factors. And I, I, I just, 360 is always goes through my head to say, you've got to look around this whole thing, whether it's compounding or whether it's using traditional manufactured products. Extending the BUD is going to potentially allow the, 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 the populace to be served with some unique preparations. And some of those are somewhat orphaned type of things that are just not meeting the needs. And so you have this extended BUD option, but you have to do diligence in order to get there. I think they have defined it. Have they defined it as a manufacturer has to define it? No, but I think we're getting a lot closer to it and we're putting more provisions on it. And frankly, a lot of these provisions that they have put on is nothing new to a lot of my clients because this is where I believe we actually need to go. I think the last time we talked, I've talked about the 503A plus kind of things, jumping forward. Well, I think this is a continuation of that. I think it's extremely important that we just look good, better, best. I don't even know what best is, but I think we've got to be much better. But trying to forecast this, and I know this is where your question is going to go, in terms of trying to forecast this, it, you know, so much turbulence and so much, you know, and unfortunately we get into politics, you know, and in this kind of thing and this this posturing of this 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 agency with this agency with the states and all this kind of stuff it's very very difficult so what i tell my clients is let's cut through all that okay let's try to forecast we can but we can't we work with wonderful organizations like a apc alliance for pharmacy compounding and American College of Apothecaries, and a lot of the, the the supportive organizations that support compounding and compounders putting a lot of effort and a lot of time and energy into this, and, and, and it is paying off, but we certainly don't want to lose access to providing some of these critical therapies and these therapies that are making a quality of life difference in the patients, but trying to forecast this out. I tell my clients is, okay, let's do what's best. Let's do what's best and try, try to afford. Now, can we do stability indicating assays and everything we do, non-sterile, whatever? Of course not. We just don't have the financial model. If you ever done that HPLC and that, then, you know, that just the methods themselves can cost tens of thousands of dollars, just developing methods. So it's not necessarily realistic. But in terms of looking to see what kind of information is out there, to see if we can model that, and, and the, better, the better we can be and the safer to our clients and what I call the loved ones, somebody has a loved one we're taking care of and the loved one that we need to we need to protect so which i think is interesting because renee raises the the point as you can tell on best yes i hate good good is a weasel word why not try her comment goes to the point that you should aim for the best why not i think you're also making the point that you've got to balance that against just the cost of doing that to get from yeah, uh, ninety-five to ninety-eight might yeah. be fifty million dollars. Uh, I'm making up numbers. I have no idea. But, no, um, no, but no. but the but the yeah. idea is: is it worth it? And the answer, it's it's very simple to say. Absolutely, a single human life is absolutely worth it. But the the, the realistic cost of how do you do that 
in a way and still operate is what makes all the difference. Um, w- when you're advising clients, well, do you okay, find- Can I come back comment, to, to, to yeah, her one, wonderful comment? So, so, Renee, I love your comment and I actually support your comment. My, I wanna clarify mine. So my point, and I think I said it, but I, when I say these things so fast, who knows? But when I say this, I don't know what best is. It's not that I don't want to be the best or my clients to be the best. Where is the bar? In other words, I like to keep this best bar up here. And we strive and strive and strive because let's say there is a best and it's defined and we know where it is. Oh, we got there and we're there. And yes, we put up our arms and we say, yes, can we do better? And so that's my point is, oh, my gosh, yes, be the best. But if you look at like USP uh, compliancy or whatever it may be, okay, that's good. That's good. But let's you have to be that. That's the law. If you're not, then you're probably going to get shut down or whatever. Better is reaching above that. And again, I just don't know where that bar is. I really don't know. So good yeah that's just law that's 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 law nobody you don't you don't want to just be there and i think there's things you can do to be better and i think there's things you can do to reach and reach and reach and maybe you can define yourself as the best i would love you to do that and you talk about a competitive advantage i love people that actually get something tested and they send their own certificate of analysis out to the prescribers or to the patients or whatever not confuse them and just say hey we test our stuff yeah yeah it's a goal and, and psychology yeah there is a psychology behind it and cost is the reality and you know even in manufacturing manufacturing there's not an endless an endless uh, tap that can just keep doing and doing and doing so i i think we have to be clearly efficient but regardless of what we do we have to be effective and and trying to define that is is mm-hmm. very tough because then you get in you know the clinical trials and stuff like that so very very hard to do so thank you renee very well stated so i i love the point renee raises and the question i have for you ken is as we start getting into a world where um we're trying to uh, U- usp itself is trying to figure out um, what should 795, 797, 800 look like? And you're advising your clients to be proactive. How do clients respond to the idea of being proactive in that, as we just said, cost is a reality? So do they yeah. find that this is a moving target and I'd rather first find out where the target is going to be stationary and then shoot at it? Or do you find that clients are going, you know what, I want to, I'd rather hit the moving target and then keep ad- adjusting depending on what the final write-up looks like. So where do you find yourself dealing with uh, with and managing client expectations? Yeah, yeah, it all depends on where the client's coming from. And, and, and unfortunately, there are some clients that are still fairly naive to things. And different states have different requirements, whether they've enforced things or not. And as things are progressing and more states getting involved in, in compliancy towards standards or their own standards or USP standards, whatever, it usually what it takes is a visit by a board of pharmacy, hopefully not the FDA that, that gets these clients coming forward. And if they're very naive, it's quite a shock. However, being in that world deeply for many, many, many years, it's, it, you have to approach it very simply and you have to approach it in segmentally. You say, oh, well, there's 52 standard operating procedures and I need you to, 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 to modify to your organization and this, 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 and then you need to implement it. You know, they freak out and they say, this is unrealistic. I can't do it in this model. I'm only one person. I'm only got one tech, whatever it may be. And, and in underserved areas and rural areas and whatever, we have to understand that. I actually was just talking to one this week in an area that's underserved and they're rural and they're trying to do the best, the best they can. And, you know, you have to try to modify and you have to document and do what I call the risk assessment. They have to do a risk assessment saying, we're doing this, we're making this, whether it's sterile or non-sterile, whatever. And here's the risk assessment. And here's how we're going to mitigate that risk. And, 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 you know, those sound like big terms and whatever. And I'm not saying these aren't bright people. It's just it's overwhelming to them. So you have to tailor it. These consultants that come in and say, here, you do this do this and do it as I say, 
no. You, we, we, I, I'm a big fan of, of, of pharmacotherapeutic personalization. I think that's where compounding really has a differentiation. You can actually personalize something for a specific patient, whether it's genomic, whether it's, whether it's a delivery system, whether it's a, an ingredient, or whatever it may be, a dosage for a dosage amount or whatever, we can personalize. And I think when you're doing subject matter work or consulting in this world, you have to personalize it. You have to understand where their baseline is, where their knowledge is, where their resources is, and that's financial resources, where they are, and how can we best achieve it. St stretching them out to be, again, quote, the best, whatever, that's going to be hard to do. So let's get them, and Renee, yeah, I agree. I hate the word good, but let's, let's get them to good. So let's get them compliant. And then from there, then work them to better a little bit, you know, just find the area. So yeah, sometimes they overreact or they react and they say, oh, I can't do this. You just have to tailor it. You just have to keep tailoring. It's a lot of work. It's a lot of work on my part. Would I love to be able to hand them a template and say, there it is, you know, here, here, implement this template, this work together. No, everybody's got their own template, but we always have to keep our sight and vision on the law and obviously doing no harm. I love it. So, so it's funny. I feel like Renee's statement has become sort of the theme for today's conversation. I love it. I love it. <laughs> yeah. what's, what's interesting yeah. to me is you actually picked up on the good versus great piece. Well, I'm fascinated by the cost is reality piece. And, and what I'm referring to is the only way you can run a business is if you are um, – making a a um how should we put this a, a profit and and doing it in a way that that makes sense my yeah. question for you is from a compounding perspective do you find yourself dealing more and more with with uh pharmacists who are saying number one you know what i want to move towards an all-cash business uh and and compounding affords me opportunities to do that. Do you find yourself dealing with pharmacists who are, uh, say, working against like uh, uh, DOJ or uh, uh, pharmacy board issues and going, you know what, I don't want to deal with uh, third party payers. I don't want to deal with any of this. I just want to focus on doing the best for my patients. And it, my patients could be vet patients for all I know. Um, and, and sort of adjusting to that. What is the business model like for pharmacists who are using this as an opportunity to ex expand, explore, or just pivot their business. It, it used to be there's there's a lot of people that came in and said, you know, I did maybe a the student who came in did a rotation with somebody, loved it, and they love what they do, and then the opportunity to get some equity and say, I'd like to do my own, and they still want to start it off. There's still that. There is still that. But however, I think what what I am seeing, or more, you know, I'm not saying the newbies. Don't come in. Come in, but you got to come in cl with clear vision of the expectations on you and what the resource uh, 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 demand is going to be on you to do it right. But I'm dealing more with seasoned people, not that I exclusively. I love the new starter, but with the the, the seasoned people that say, "Okay, I'm I'm acquiring this business and whatever, and I'm going to acquire more and this this," because the way these standards are somewhat going is centers of excellence. That's, that's, I know, you know, a lot of people abuse that term, but I'm going to use that so people can just kind of see that these centers of excellence. So you can have the resources, the personnel training is a lot of what I do. It's not just training on the regs, it's training on good practices, you know, aseptic practices. What does good look like? I mean, the hand position, critical first air, how they're cleaning, you know, if they clean like some of them clean their homes, if you're invited in there, it's very, very important to say, okay, you don't clean like you're cleaning your home. You have to have dwell time. You have to make sure you have a sporocidal and, and, and a disinfectant and you have the right cleaner and those are and, and the like. So I'm getting more of these seasoned type of companies and the seasoned companies say, hey, you know, we need to position ourselves. And I think that gets back into, and I'm going to, Renee, I see, see your comment and I, I'll respond to it. But I want to get into the, 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 the uh, regulations that, that were coming out. It was a memorandum of understanding by the FDA with the state boards of pharmacy. 
So the FDA can have some oversight and see what's going on in these compounding pharmacies if these pharmacies are shipping across state lines. And I understand that it's interstate, and you know, you I, I'd like to hear your response on that as well, Darshan. But that was that was held back. So that's another thing that just recently occurred is they 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 have suspended it for a year, and then they're going to readdress it with the state boards because the state boards didn't seem quite ready for it. And right. so there was a certain 5% only they could send across state lines. And what if you were near a, a tri-state area or something like that and patients were dependent upon it. So there was a lot of unknowns. But my point is, if you're sending across all these state lines and you're sending this and you're this center of excellence, it makes sense to have a center of excellence that's sending out here because they have a higher with this new category of compounding called category three that they've put, they have a, a higher standard and expectation. So to that, and I don't, I don't see Renee's uh, comment. So you can recite that back. So the comment is I'm startled how matter of fact, these subjects are amongst professionals in QA and capital is utterly ignorant of it, which I think is an interesting comment because yes. it's the, it's the mm -hmm. distinction between compliance and quality and yeah. what capital is expecting at the same time. Right. So, uh, and just to be clear, uh, just to clarify, capital being ca uh, venture capitalists, it could be seed right. capitalists, right. um, or basically any kind of investor. Uh, and Renee, if I got that wrong, feel free to tell me. But um, that's what I think she's uh, going down. So, yeah, I'd love to hear your sort of response to that because you are dealing with both mature companies and startups. Uh, yeah. And and how is this playing out? Yeah, absolutely. You know, as these standards keep growing, obviously the resource uh, allocation has to be diverted to there. And do they have enough capital to do it and, and still still make the margins they need to make to keep the business running? Um, and that's why I feel bad for these small organizations. Now, um, my point about these centers of excellence, obviously, they can have economies of scale. Um, if you can take advantage of economies of scale and say, you know, I've, I've got more volume, maybe less margin, but I have more volume in order to sustain that. And I have resources and all this equipment you're talking about now with this, this category three, they're saying you have to do viable testing every month and you're going to bring an organization in to do your viable error testing and all that. You're probably going to do it yourself. So you're going to have to get a vac active air sampler. Then you're going to have to send it out. You're going to have to do all these microbials and all these kind of things. And da, 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 da. So how can capital? Yeah. There, there's, there, there's just this, not this endless pool. And it's like, well, you keep doing this, 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 and this. And that's why the, the, the newbie, the starter, we've got to go in realistic. Now, it's the newbie, the starter may not be getting into aseptic compounding to start. Maybe they want to go there when they get some level of a development of a non-sterile component. But they're still, you know, those standards are getting tighter and harder and, and, and what have you as well. So that may be, if talking to the newbies, that may be where you can go. But do understand, based on what Renee said, the, the capital, well, what capital you need to do this. If you have a hazardous drug, you actually have to now vent that room out. <clears throat> you have to have a sealed room. Yeah. And you have to vent that out. And how much air conditioning are you putting in that you're kicking out 12 air changes per hour? You have to have seamless counters and things that are not going to harbor this hazard. You have to have PPE that's not going to certainly affect you or your employees or the caregiver or the, or the user with another contaminant or something like that. So it's, it, it, that's all appropriate, but it costs money. You may right. have to get a separate HVAC system, which could be tens of thousands of dollars, depending on the size of the facility. So, yeah, I agree with you, Nate. This imbalance of capital and quality is whatever. It's like quality needs to be here, and capital's here. And how do I, uh, you know, how do I bring that up until I make, you know, start making some revenue here, and then the margins are shrinking. It's like, you know, so, and that's why a lot of venture capital people are coming in there and saying, hey, this is a sector we believe in. And, you know, we would like to to expand and we would like to grow and we would like to see how we can better serve. I think the MOU was going to be a risk for a while because it was going to maybe just restrict people to individual states. So now there's a reprieve. But I think ultimately you've got a plan to say. How are you going to be able to take across interstate if that MOU hits? Because maybe 50 percent is what they said was going to be the. The, the top limit, you can't distribute any more than 50% of, of, of your state. And 
well, what if you want to do 60%? Well, you know, do you need to become a 503B or whatever? So Darshan, my question to you is now we have a variety Absolutely. of people out here and you know, you, you, you one heck of a JD and your pharmacy background and, 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 and all of that. What do you, what do you think a 503A should do? That's, that's in the game. They're playing and they keep, putting in capital, 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 and then you've got this MOU out there, you've got this new category three that's having more requirements for stability indicating assays, which are very costly, more capital to invest in, so you can actually have the stability studies to show it, then you have to prove sterility. What do you think? And you, you think some of these folks should make the giant leap and say, I'm gonna be a manufacturer, and I'm gonna be a 503B, and I'm gonna be compliant with all of those CGMP regulations and the FDA is going to regularly visit me. So so I have, um, my, my perspective is very simple. My perspective is do what's in the best interest of patients. If you're a pharmacist, that's what we all went to school for. We all went to school to say, how can we do better for pharmacists? If that's true, whether you're talking on 503A, you're talking on 503B, or true blue manufacturing, in all three scenarios, they're just different levels of how can I do better for my patients? If you are already being held up to higher standards or you already foresee higher standards being required, in that case, I'd say, you know what, why not make that, that leap? Now, there's a good reason why not. The good reason is because I don't have the cash to pull it off right now. Um, but assuming you can pull that cash together, assuming that's just the cost of doing business at a certain point, does it, it, it might make sense for you to raise your, your bar and aim for the higher standard. And if you do that, I think it, it affords opportunities not just to sell within your state, but across the 50 states. And that, that has significant advantages to you as a business that's growing. So I, to, to, the, to answer your question, and this is sort of reminds me of the um, Reddit posts where, um, but they, they ask us to sort of too long, didn't read too long, didn't read short version. Um, do it, do it now. But, um, but yeah, that, that would be my take. Um, I have a comment here from Renee. I don't know if we can go, get into it. We usually aim for about 15, 20 minutes. We're already well past the 30 minute mark, but I'm going to just put this in here. If you can give a quick answer, uh, Ken, I, uh, I lumped uh, GMP cannabinoids for four years across. Well, no, I actually was saying I humped uh, uh, GMP cannabinoids for four years across Canada. Why GMP is so expensive? Why? Because pharma buyouts are more, more valuable. Capital disagreed. Nobody else is. Um, nobody in QA or pharma disagreed. So I'm not 100% sure about the point she's making. But if you, if you know what, that's, what she's going for, feel free to comment. Yeah, uh, I, th I think I know where she's going on it in regards okay, cool. to, so, you know, the cannabinoids, obviously, you know, Canada, you know, they have a different perspective than the U.S. does as well, and, and it is recreational, but you can't compound with, with that, so obviously you have to, in, in some do, but you're not supposed to in Canada, and uh, here we can't obviously do that in the States. And But the if you, if you do then manufacture, then, then you have the ability to do that. Uh, in Canada, but then you are, you have so much validation to do, and the validation costs so much money. And in terms of the the the, the pharma buyouts, uh, okay, you could you could you could you could acquire one and just say you know change your line or whatever. But trying to do that, and again, whether you go the total total blue way or you actually just go into a five or three B world, well, Canada doesn't have that. They do have an outsourcer. Uh, a perspective of that, but again, you get in the cannabinoids, and and those are just not approved for for manipulation and compounding, and having that manufactured by these compounding or co excuse me contract manufacturers, they are under the auspices in Canada of Health Canada in the United States under the FDA, but here in the United the United States, it's a whole different regulation when you get into the cannabinoids and modifying the cannabinoids. So. I think the only way you're going to do it in the United States is you're going to be you're going to have to be a manufacturer of those and trying to get that licensure is so 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 hard. It's so controlled and it's so you know it's it's so positioned upon who you knew when this first came out and all that kind of thing. So that it's a tough world and there's a lot of capital that has to go into it, but sometimes I think 
what is the criteria for the manufacturer of cannabinoids versus the manufacturer of pharmaceuticals? I think I, I think I, there's a whole I, different I, tier. I I, th I think you're right, and I think that the FDA actually came out and said they're not going going to regulate cannabinoids as dietary supplements anymore. They're going to regulate them as drugs. And what what is the implication? Off a statement like that. So I think that should be interesting. But yeah. it's a whole other discussion. We should start sort of closing up because we start losing people around this time. So as you know, I'm going to ask you four questions. Uh, the first question, and we've sort of thrown that up there, is how can people contact you? Yes. And I think you've sort of given the email of ken.spidel at gateconsult.com. Um, is there any other way people can reach you? Or is that yeah, you, you can call the corporate office uh, Gates at, at Gates. I'm sorry, go to the go to the website www.gateshealthcareassociates and and contact them. Ask for for Dan Parisi, he's a great guy, and tell him what your need is, and tell him you need to get a hold of me or or you need other services. Just so you know, Gates. You know, we do DEA work, we do hospital health system work. We have a new vice president of health systems, unbelievable guy. He does uh, 540Bs uh, uh, and, and you, you name it, or excuse me, 340Bs and, and on and on and on. And we do a lot of work in health systems and hospitals, aseptic facilities and, and process and uh, all kind of things. So we, we, have, we have people in pretty much every regard. We have FDA people uh, and, and, and we, we have great attorneys. Sorry. <laughs> somewhere, somewhere. You know where they are. <laughs> guy next to me on the picture. So uh, uh, we have great attorneys that uh, that we can utilize that can, that can help. So anyway, give them a call. We can help you out. And if you're interested in even talking further, just just give a call, give a shake. Perfect. Next question for you. What would you like to ask the audience? Great question. You know, anytime you attend one of these things, you you, you say, well, wh what do you want to hear about? You know, and so pertaining to my subject matter expertise, whether it's you know, and I, we can't get deep into therapeutics, but if it's in the pain management, compounded personalization for pain management, personalization of pharmacotherapy, individualization, how to get through in certain disease states and conditions, uh, 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 what I call uh, biomimetic hormone restoration, in other words, the various hormones and endocrinology and how compounding can help that world and things like that, or just trying to do things better and try to formulate things better. Education, I do a lot of education, whatever. So if you, there's some niche or something you want to talk about and you think a larger audience would talk about, please let Darshan know. We'll, we'll you know, we can maybe queue it up and we can answer some of your questions. So I'm, I'm going to tell you the answer that I want to have, have with you, the discussion I want to have with you, Ken, hopefully soon. Um, but my big question, I'm dealing more and more with, uh, with clients who are trying to move away from, uh, EBMs and from yeah. third-party payers, and they're looking for new business models that enable that. So I'm looking forward to having that conversation with you, right? Be uh, happy. at some point. Yep. And 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 most most of the payers are clearing that out anyway for them. And so that as you asked early on, I don't think I ever answered you. It's it's more of a cash business in the 503A world and B world as well. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so next question for you: What's something you've learned in the last month? Mm. You always come up with these <laughs> great little questions. Well, I learned how I relearned how to change change a diaper um, because we had a grandbaby. <laughs> I know that isn't where you wanted me to go, but I'm going there. Oh, I, that's perfect. That's I perfect. hadn't changed a diaper in an infant for a long time, and so I had I, uh, my mentor was my wife, and my, the the patient was a beautiful new grandbaby. Congratulations. And, yeah, yeah, he's oh, he's some. So anyway, yeah, yeah, he came back, he came back, he came back, he came back. So he I did like riding a bicycle. That poops. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> and that not, that part hasn't changed. And I, I'm thinking I, I've got some serious PPE. You know, I got pamper mask and all these different things. I think I'd scare the heck out of him. I put a pamper mask on. You know, <laughs> and, but yeah. that's awesome. Yeah, uh, okay. talking about hazardous substances there. Uh, yeah, yeah, depending on what, <laughs> what, what what my daughter ate. Yes, exactly. <laughs> um, next question, last question. What's something that made you happy in the last? Well, week? I'm going down that same route. He was just born three weeks ago. So, <clears throat> yeah, awesome. Oh, last That's amazing. Uh, in the last week, um, 
But, 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 well, he, you know, he came over. He came over and uh, did a little dip in the swimming pool, and you know that made me happy. But what what made me happy is is actually had a client uh, had a very good good outcome with uh, with a therapeutic uh, suggestion we worked on and and what have you, and the patient's doing very very well. So um, that that always that always helps. So oh, that's wonderful. Yes. To be clear, when I ask that question, I do intend that it can be a completely personal response. If well, that's what you it wanted. was, so, and it I was. loved your answer. Thank <laughs> you. I loved your question. Well, Ken, it was as always incredible to have you on. I can't wait for you to come on again next time. And uh, stay tuned, everyone. Please, please, please reach out to Ken. Feel free to reach out to me, and we will be in touch shortly. Take care, everybody.